Is that on? Is that hot? Do you want this? Uh, <laughs> Good evening and welcome to St. Michael and All Angels Pub Theology for 2021. Glad that you're with us. It's so nice to have quite a few people here in attendance and for those who are, are tuning in online, glad that you've joined us. Um, I'm Bob Johnston. I'm one of the clergy on staff and I'll be your host this evening in helping with this. And uh, in a few minutes, I'll explain exactly how the whole night's going to go and how everything works. But um, one of the things we learned last summer is that it would be fun to add some music to pub theology. So we started that last summer, and it, it was very well received, and we decided we would do that again this summer. So we're going to start out with uh, a group. I'm going to introduce them in just a second. They're going to do one song now, and then when we take a break in a little bit, which I'll tell you about the timing on, they're going to do a couple more songs then. Um, so that's where we're headed with this, um, and I'll say more in just a few minutes. But let me introduce our uh, music group. We decided that it'd be fun to have different groups in the Dallas area that are getting some buzz and having, getting some attention. And so we've got four different groups lined up during the course of um, Pub Theology. But tonight is a special uh, thing because we, we get to have Roscoe Johnny with us tonight. And they are a family trio with Justin and Tiffany Brooks and Morgan Taylor. And their music is described as Texas folk with a little bit of country thrown in um, to make it spicy. So that's kind of, and it's the kind of thing that if you're sitting on your port somewhere in Texas or the deep woods of East Texas or somewhere, it's the kind of thing that goes and has that kind of feel with it. And um, they've been getting lots of great attention for their debut album that came out in Trio that um, was uh, produced by Billy Smiley, who's done people like Johnny Cash and Stephen Curtis Chapman and lots of, lots of great folks. And it actually ended up coming out on uh, Southern Sky Records, and um, like I say, it's gotten, gotten lots of great attention. They had some, you're going to hear in a moment how great they are, but they also had some great performers with them, Phil Kagey and um, Buddy Miller and some others who joined in on that record. So um, really, really good stuff. They play in acoustic venues around Dallas and around Texas. And if you want to learn more about them, first of all, I would encourage you to, to um, find them wherever you get streaming music from. You can look them up there, or you can go to their website, roscoejohnny.com. Um, and I'll get, maybe at the end, before the night's over, I'll have Justin spell that out so you can know exactly what it is. But will you join me in welcoming Roscoe Johnny? Yeah. 
That's awesome, guys. Thank you. And they'll be back um, during our break to do some more music. Um, so I want to say a few things about what we're doing tonight. Um, so Pup Theology started as something where we want, like when things are back to complete normal, it's great to have people here, but we're not quite back in the pub. But when we're in the pub, the idea is we want to go out to a place where everybody's comfortable going and where we can engage a really interesting theological topic that would be of interest to anyone. And sort of the idea behind what we're doing with pub theology it, um, goes back to something that somebody said to us a few years back where they said, not quite ready for church, but glad you came to us. That's kind of the deal. But so we want to be out. We want to, we want to do some engaging topics and do it in a very comfortable place. And it doesn't get any easier than saying, come have a beer and hear something interesting. So that's kind of what the attitude is behind what we're doing with it. I know everybody in the room knows who we are, but those streaming who've heard about this and maybe joining us may not. We're an Episcopal church that's near Preston Center in Dallas, and we have traditional worship, contemporary worship, and we're a growing church with lots of energy, and I would encourage you to come, come and see and just check it out. I want to thank the Pub Theology Committee that's worked um, during this year to help with topics and lining things up, and um, I'll say them by name in just a little bit. Let me tell you how the night's going to go. So uh, in just a few minutes, we'll ask our speaker to come up. He's going to give a talk somewhere between 30, 40 minutes kind of time frame, and then we'll take a 10-minute break, and that's when we'll have music again. But during that time, when we start that, um, he's going to come back after that for 20 minutes of Q&A. And the way we do questions, um, if you're in the room, you've got these slips of paper that are on your tables. So as he's speaking, or, as you, or maybe you've already had a burning question you showed up with tonight, um, write the question on there. We'll collect those during the break, and he'll have a chance to organize them and, and get kind of set for that. If you're watching online, we'll be able to submit those. And Colleen, you may have to tell me exactly where we're submitting those to. What's that? On Facebook? Okay. So you would submit them there, and, we'll, and that's a way that you can get questions to us, and we'll write those down, and that'll be um, part of the format as well. Um, our speaker tonight, I'm going to introduce um, Ruben Habito. He was one of my professors back at uh, Perkins School of Theology at SMU, where I went, and um, is a well-beloved professor there. He teaches world religions um, and theology of religions, and he specializes in that, and of course, and he specializes in um, Eastern Asian Buddhism, um, amongst uh, many other interests that he, that he has. A little bit of background on him. He uh, did his undergraduate degree um, in the Philippines, where he's originally from. And then he, he has four different degrees. Um, he went on to do a, a master's at Tokyo University, another one from Sophia University, and then a doctor's of letter um, certificate from Tokyo University. Um, as I said, he was born in the Philippines. He, he became a Jesuit, and the Jesuits sent him to Japan. And that's where he served um, in Japan. While he was there, his um, supervisor, Father Hand, um, wanted him to engage with Zen. So he started doing some studies there. And over the next uh, long period of time, he studied Zen and, and became a Zen um, teacher in, uh, I think it was the late 80s. And then he took an assignment here in, at SMU back in about 1989 or so. And um, shortly after he arrived, there were a number of students at SMU that knew he was uh, had this background as a Zen teacher who wanted him to do some of that. And so that was ultimately that percolated and became the Dallas Zen Center. And it's since um, changed names, but it's um, he's been involved in that scene here in Dallas um, ever since the start of it. It's now called the Maria Canaan Zen Center. Would you join me in welcoming Professor Ruben Abito? Thank you, Bob, for that gracious introduction. It's a joy for me to be here with you tonight, and a special joy since we've just been through a time when we were all uh, unable to come together like this. So, and I am glad especially to know that this is the first of the pub theology uh, from now on when we can, be, uh, we can drink and be merry again <laughs> and, and talk serious theology at the same time. So uh, I was invited by St. Michael's to offer some thoughts on a topic that I also uh, teach at Perkins on um, Christianity and world religions. And so some of you may have heard that talk online, so I don't know to what extent I'll be repeating myself. So if I do, just forget about what you heard before and just have new ears to listen to what I'll uh, offer tonight. 
I would like to begin by uh, inviting us to just pause and take a deep breath. Just pause and breathe and do that three times. Thank you. If you were paying attention, what happened in those moments when we became silent and just listened to the breath was that we were connected to every living thing on earth that also breathes. Both the animal kingdom, I call it, by the way, kingdom, not kingdom, not the one where a king reigns, but a place where everyone is kin, and also the trees the plant kingdom, who give forth the oxygen that we of the animal kingdom need. And then when we breathe out, we give back carbon dioxide, which the plants also need for their nutrients. And so it's an exchange of life. And that's exactly what we are supported by, this exchange of life of all living beings. So every moment that we exist on this earth, and with every breath, we are supported by that circle of life that holds us together. And lo and behold, it's a wonder and mystery. Where does this all come from? And where are we, where are we heading? And those are the kinds of questions that brings forth the religious impulse in humanity. So as I said, um, this is what I also teach at Perkins. And uh, uh, Bob was one of the victims of those uh, courses that I teach. But uh, so, as a disclosure, what I will offer tonight is a short, 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 short version of what I usually cover in one semester. <laughs> so, uh, relax. Uh, anyway, I begin, I'd like to begin tonight by also inviting us to look at the world as we see it in the media or from your own encounters or those of you who have traveled abroad to remember the kinds of things that you met there. And one description of our current world is that it is a world in conflict and of diverse, uh, 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 conflict and violence and diversity. So many different ways in which human beings live their lives and so many different kinds of convictions about why they're there and so many things that uh, people think about that are at loggerheads with what other people are thinking about. In short, we're living in a world with so much difference, and we're finding it hard to, to uh, come, ter come to terms with that difference. And so what many of us tend to do would be to form little groups that we can feel we will be comfortable in, and then try to think in terms of us. We're, uh, we're the good ones, we're the good persons, and those are the bad ones. <laughs> And so it's a kind of a mentality that gets cultivated. And that's precisely what's at the root of conflict in the world today. <clears throat> when a group of people think, we have the good and those are the bad ones. And so let's get rid of them. <clears throat> or at least let's not talk to them. Or uh, let's see how we can compete with them and uh, show that we're better. This is a mentality that contemporary writers, writers are calling tribalism. It has nothing to do with the uh, indigenous tribes and so on. It's just a take from that term. But it's a mentality that makes human beings go to seek refuge and comfort zones in a small group that feel the same or think the same ways and so on and look at others as outsiders or as other. And that's, as I said, a great cause of the world's conflict today. Now, unfortunately, religion is also a big factor in that kind of tribalism. Those of us who are in the Christian tradition know that throughout our formation in the church, our Sunday school and so on, we are taught that we have revelation, we have the truth, we have the way to heaven. And those others, well, since they don't, they're going to hell. And that's been to uh, co common an attitude among those who have been raised Christian. And so those who are of good-minded uh, and good-hearted adults think of that and say, I don't really think that that's true because I have met so many people who, are, who don't go to church 
or I meet people of other religions, and they're good, and uh, I can be friends with them, and I like them, and I even admire them. So how can a church say that kind of thing? And so people begin to question what the church is teaching about those others. So what I'd like to offer tonight are some ways in which Christian theologians have considered how Christians can relate to what is uh, called the religious other. I'm using a technical term here, but it's not derogatory. It's just someone who does not belong to my little tribe, the other. Well, if there is such a thing, it's something that really is a construct in our minds, that there are others. But in any case, uh, hopefully we can go deeper than that. So what? Uh, how can Christians relate to, first of all, think about and relate to and engage with others who are not of the same Christian faith and community? That's a question that is a very important one for us Christians. For those of us who really have come to appreciate our faith as something that is life-giving, as really the good news that liberates us and allows us to be fully ourselves and gives us joy and gives us a sense of where we're going with glory and with a sense of connecting with all of creation, the Christian faith is something that we would like to share with others. But if it's that th kind of thing where if you don't get it, then sorry, I won't have anything to do with you, then uh, you'll be, uh, um, you're going to hell. And unfortunately, that's something that is often heard from Christians. I, not among this group, I'm sure that uh, you don't say such things. But so now, how can we really look at this matter and really examine what our own Christian message tells us about how we can relate to the others, religious others? If we read the Bible, in so many passages, we see a mixed message. There are some passages that really proclaim God as the creator of all and the author of all that is good, and all creatures, big and small, belong to God, and all creatures are loved by God. And then there are passages that talk about God's chosen ones, and those others have to be fought and uh, vanquished and so on. Or there are passages in the New Testament that some of us take and say, well, see, uh, the Bible is the word of God, so it's the truth, and what it says must be so. Like, for example, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. So, therefore, those who don't go with Jesus are going elsewhere, namely to perdition. So that's the very simple or simplistic conclusion that many people get from reading those passages. So, but is that really what Jesus wanted to convey to his followers? This is where we need to do some reflection and investigation and a little more deep, uh, a little deeper scripture reading and reflection also. And this is what the word theology refers to. It's about, well, theology is God talk. Talk about those things that are ultimate. Talk, talk about those things that really um, refer to those big questions like, what am I here for? Who am I? Where am I going? And what is my ultimate destiny? And what is the ultimate destiny of all other people and all other beings in relation to mine? So those are the big questions that theology asks. So now, in that regard, just to give a very kind of a typological summary, there are three attitudes that have developed among Christians in relation to how to view and how to relate to the religious other. In uh, the early 20th century, there was a uh, Swiss theologian named Karl Barth who gave a distinction between revelation and religion, saying that what matters for human ultimate salvation is revelation. It is God who gives us revelation. It is God who is the author of salvation. And indeed, that is a basic fact, a basic uh, uh, truth that we Christians accept, that what we know about God is not from our own human seeking, but it is something that God has given to us to know. And so if we have an open heart and we are open to the workings of the Holy Spirit, then we can have access to that, and then that 
movement of the Holy Spirit moves us to take the right steps, like go uh, and uh, be baptized and uh, uh, live according to the Gospels, namely live in a way that is loving and so on. And so then, but in Bart's distinction, unfortunately, he also said, well, religion is a human concoction. It's what humans construct when they are faced with ultimate questions and they don't know how to approach it. So they uh, construct these ideas about an ultimate reality or an absolute, and then they construct realities about how to behave and so on. And he said, well, uh, it's since in our Christian tradition, we know that Jesus Christ is what was given to us by God and is the full, uh, the full, uh, the fullness of God's revelation, showing us God's love. Then all the others are invalid. So that category of his, unfortunately, set forth a kind of uh, an attitude that is called theological exclusivism. Only Christians have the truth and only Christians can be saved. Now, if we are raised in a church and in a context where we only meet other Christians, that seems to be a uh, kind of a, uh, an understanding and view of the world that can hold. But then when we start to meet those who are not from the Christian tradition and realize, hey, they're good, peop good people also. They're also trying their best to be human, and they're also loving, and they're also kind, and we can fr be friends with them. Where would they fit in that schema? So somehow this exclusivistic stance does not seem to work because then what do we do? How do we relate to those others? Can we just uh, do we just say yeah, because you don't you're not uh, you're not following uh, following Jesus then uh, you go to hell? So this is where another approach is presented, and here it's a German theologian named Karl Rahner who uh, uh, proposed this based on his reflections on the teachings of Thomas Aquinas and of more recent philosophers and theologians also. So he came up with the basic, first of all, the basic acceptance that it is God's will that all people be saved. We see that in scripture. It is God's will that all people be saved. But then how about those others who are not yet able to hear that word of God through Jesus? Well, in his own reflections based on, again, I won't go into complexities, but just to try to uh, make it um, uh, as simple as I can, the basic way that God works is through our conscience. If we really look at our lives, we see moments, we, we, we encounter moments when we are, made, uh, are given a choice between, should I do this or should I do that? And there are some moments when something tells us, no, I shouldn't do that. That'll be harmful or that'll be something that's not good for myself or for others. And so then we do what we feel is good and wholesome. In those cases, when we make a choice, he, uh, Rahner would say, that's the prompting of the Holy Spirit. That's the work of God in us, telling us where the right way is. And that's really the spirit of Jesus working without being known. So he said, uh, he proposed, we can accept the fact that the Christian community is the recipient of God's revealing truth, but it doesn't necessarily express itself in explicit ways like Christian worship or Christian proclamation. The work of God is also given through all of God's creation because all of creation, the earth, the universe, are all handiworks of God. And so God also takes care of God's own creation and so there must be ways in which God is taking care of them. And so those little stirrings of conscience that people follow are precisely the work of God through the Holy Spirit in them. And so with that, then we can say, when they say yes to that prompting of the Holy Spirit, they are saying yes to the Spirit of God in Jesus Christ. Although, he said, anonymously. So he coined a term called anonymous Christian. <laughs> they are Christian without knowing it. So at least that extends the, uh, the range of salvation a bit wider. 
Now, what's, uh, what's wrong with that? Well, we'll go back to that a little later. But then uh, some people felt that's still not enough. That's uh, still a little too condescending. Maybe we can say that all religions are ways of human beings to try to reach God. And when we reach that summit from the different directions that we reach, uh, from, uh, that we get, uh, get there, we realize, hey, we're living in the same realm. We're living under the same reality of what if, if you, Christ, uh, you Christians might call it love or God, Muslims might call it Allah, Buddhists might call it Nirvana, and so on. So this is a proposal by John Hick, a British theologian who um, gave the image of different paths leading up to a mountain peak. So the different religions he proposed can be considered as different paths with different contours and so on and different ways. But ultimately, when they get to the top, they realize, hey, we have something in common here. So let's celebrate. So that's uh, the so-called pluralistic view of religions. Now, these three, if we reflect on them, are frameworks by, that Christians have constructed to be able to deal with others in a way that makes sense, given what we understand from Christian revelation and Christian theology. So now, let's go to Karl Barth. He made this distinction between re revelation, in which he affirmed that all salvation and all truth comes from God. But then his demarcation of religion somehow was a little too uh, constricting. When he was asked, but what about the Hindus? Uh, there are so many good people there. They do sacrifices and they do uh, charity and so on. That's a religion. I have no concern with that. So he had a framework of mind that already eliminated others outside of Christianity from his field of interest. But some Christian theologians who are followers of Bart himself asked the question, OK, revelation is what's important for salvation. But could God have and did God actually reveal God's self to people outside of Christianity? And so the question there is, who can say no to that? Who can limit God from what God wants to do? So there's the big flaw in Karl Barth's framework. In ruling out religion, so to speak, as in his de definition as outside of revelation, he was already making a human-made distinction that cut off so much of the world from his field of concern, unfortunately. So the question that his own followers Bart's followers are now pursuing is, now let's see, are there signs of God's revelation in other religious traditions? So let's explore. So rather than saying yes in the beginning, uh, right from the start, or no, let's find out. So let's go out and encounter them. So in that regard, Bart's distinction between religion and revelation can be held, except that now we need to unlock revelation from just being confined to the Christian, but also be open to the possibility that God is an all-loving God in who in so many ways and in God's own hidden ways gives God's own revelation to others. So now it is tantamount for us Christians to go out and seek where God is giving that revelation to others. So in fact then, we are duty-bound as Christians then to go out and meet others so that we ourselves can find out the wondrous works of God all over the world, and not just within our own little field that has been um, historically determined by all of these events that make us one billion or so Christians as opposed to so many billions of others and so on. So that we not, when we know that God's, when we know the possibility, we're not saying yes or no yet, but when we acknowledge the possibility that God is at work in so many other places, in so many other ways, then by all means, precisely to know more about God, we need to explore Hinduism, Buddhism, or Baha'i, or how other religions are uh, proclaiming what it is to live in the world and how they may also uh, do what is good for them. And so that begins to, uh, that uh, opens a bridge towards interfaith communication. Now the proposal of Karl Rahner, he opens the f uh, possibility of others, of the whole 
creation to be open to God because he says that yes, the um, p- uh, possibility of God's at work, being at work in others is there. But still, Jesus Christ is the way. Jesus Christ is the best. And the church is the holder of all truth. And the others are just partial. And that seems to be a little bit condescending. <laughs> if I, uh, as I describe it in, the, in that way, that already is an obvious thing you notice. And unfortunately, well, those of us who are well-meaning may think that. We, we want to preserve that truth of the Christian faith and revelation, that it's uh, ultimate and that it's definitive and it applies to all. And so we feel, well, but we have the fullness and those others are only partial. But that itself is another human-made distinction. How do we know? We have the fullness of revelation, but how do we know that that fullness is given in another way in Hinduism or Buddhism or other faith traditions. Imagine a bucket that is full. Let's say that bucket is about a gallon in, uh, in volume. Okay, that's full. And then imagine a little uh, whiskey shot glass. That can also be full. And then imagine a drum, a big, uh, a big gasoline drum, and fill it. They're all full. So where is the fullness? So maybe we need to learn and look at others to see where the fullness is and really be more humble and see that maybe we can learn something from those others who may have their own fullness that we can also, that will enable us also to expand our understanding of who Christ is and what the implication of Christ can be, what we call Christ, but they may call it by some other name. By the way, let me cite and recommend a book that might help in some of these theological, uh, theological uh, uh, conundrums that some of us may be, may be reflecting on. Father Richard Rohr has written many books, but among them, a recent one is called The Universal Christ. Another name for everything is his subtitle. And I, I won't say anything further, but just to recommend that. By the way, uh, there is a seminar, a workshop that will be given on this book, uh, The Universal Christ, by a colleague of ours at our Spiritual Direction uh, Certification Program uh, on The Universal Christ by Dr. Jana Renzel. So if you'd like, if you're interested, check her out, Jana, J-A-N-A, Renzel, R-E-N-T-Z-E-L, and Universal Christ, and uh, the... um, how to join that seminar, which will be on June 19, is advertised there. I won't charge you for that, Jana. <laughs> anyway, I mentioned that because the universal Christ can be a transformative book for Christians. When we release Christ from the fan- fences of our historical Christian communities and allow Christ to be Christ, namely the Logos, the one who was there in the beginning and who was with God and who is God and who permeates all and who exudes love in all. And so an understanding of Christ that can be very liberating is what I feel we all need. Now how about pluralism, John Hick? Again, I have my uh, questions about whether we can put all religions on the same plane because somehow that would diminish or that would somehow compromise the Christian understanding that Christ is a prime uh, source of salvation for a Christian. So it's hard for a Christian who holds that, the primacy of Christ, to be a real pluralist because that would tend to some kind of relativism. But still, the word pluralism is used in more wholesome ways in which we say, okay, I allow you to be you, as long as you allow me to be me and we can all live together and we work together and we learn from one another. But not stop saying, okay, you can be you and we can agree on our differences and we just go on our separate fields. If that's the way pluralism works, then it's still going to be some kind of tribal, uh, quasi-tribal mentality. What we de- uh, very urgently need, especially with this crumbling world of ours and with this ecological crisis that we're facing, is a set of guidelines for people from different sectors, especially from different religious regions, to know that we are kin with one another. And that kinship is, from our Christian way of understanding it, the kinship that 
is given to us by being all in the image of God. Whether we actually acknowledge it and join and be baptized and join the church and so on and do the things that Christians do, or whether we follow our conscience, even rejecting Christ, rejecting the church because so many things that people have done in the name of Christ are really very ugly and very uh, uh, repulsive. And so there are many people who don't want to be Christian precisely because of such things, but they want to live a good conscience and they want to live in a way that is responsible to others and responsible to the earth. And so how can we live in a way that we can embrace one another in those differences, but not stop at those differences, but engage one another in our way of deepening towards our own understanding of what we believe is our own tradition and somehow broadening it in a way that can be embracing and more welcoming. So in, uh, just to conclude my little uh, summary here, exclusivism, inclusivism, and pluralism somehow have their strengths, but they also have their flaws. So how can we go beyond these three and really have an attitude that can really be what I can say in a, in a wholehearted way, truly Christian. And what do I mean by that? Loving and welcoming and hospitable. That's what I'd like to mean by Christian, not someone who belongs to a certain tribe that calls themselves that and says others are going to hell. Unfortunately, there are too many of those who call themselves Christian that somehow demean what being Christian means by their attitude. And I hope we're not, uh, nobody here is uh, in, that, uh, in that group. If you are, sorry. To, uh, <laughs> but in any case, what I would like to offer is an invitation to really look at ourselves basically as beloved of God and in realizing that I am a beloved one of God, I realize that, oh, this person whom I find hard to get along with, maybe they're also beloved of God. Hmm, maybe there's something to that so that Maybe I can break down some of the barriers that are blocking me from relating to that person, and so on. And so to do that, we're all invited to really go back deep into our own heart of hearts and experience that place where we can be in that presence of love. And so a concrete, practical recommendation. Every day, take a few minutes doing nothing. Just sit down somewhere where you're comfortable Sit with your back straight if you can and just breathe in, breathe out. And well, start with one minute every now and then, sitting like that and breathing in, breathing out. That will take about four or five breaths in the normal uh, person. But if you have come to know, uh, if you've come to breathe with a little more uh, depth to it, maybe two or three breaths is what will take a minute. But so anyway, enjoy that breath doing nothing, and just allow your heart to be still. Maybe something will nudge you or something will open up in that stillness and maybe change your life. Thank you. All right, thank you, Professor Beto. Um, here's what's gonna happen now. So we're gonna take uh, about a 10 minute break and uh, Roscoe Johnny is going to play during that time. But what we're going to do during this time is if you have any questions that came out of that talk or more generally about world religions that you want to ask, make sure you take a moment and write it on one of the slips of the Q&A, um, the question slips that are on your tables, or send it in on the Facebook, um, the comments there, and we'll get those to Professor Abito, and he'll come back, and we're going to give him 20 minutes to answer as many questions as he can. So I encourage you to do that, and um, let's welcome back Roscoe Johnny. Also, make sure you fill out one of the surveys for me. <laughs> this next song uh, is a song about finding common ground when two people have wronged each other and uh, finding forgiveness. It's called Bag Full of Stones.
some songs and we started to talk about how there are times in life where you might have been on a certain journey and gone down that road for a long time and whether it's by tragedy or unforeseen circumstances um, you have to start over and go to the front of that road and we wanted to write a song about finding the courage to put one foot in front of the other and walk down that road again so this is called a thousand more to go hope you enjoy it Father's charm, face so beautiful it breaks your heart. Circles in my mind over where we've been. It's a long walk back to start again. Gave away twenties and a family name to a good. 
look and lie with the night is strange. Nothing whispers in her ear but the howling wind. It's a long walk back to start again. It's a long walk back to start again. Oh, keeps my feet walking. Oh. Carry myself to the open road of calling One mile gone, a thousand more to go One mile gone, a thousand more to go Thank uh, Roscoe Johnny. That was awesome. And if you didn't get that website, I'm going to spell it for you now. It's R O S C O J O H N N Y dot com. And um, they do they perform in, lot, in lots of different venues that are acoustical around town, but and around the state. But I know they also do a good bit out of this place called the Triple N Winery, which is out near Cedar Creek Lake. So um, if you want to check them out, they're there fairly frequently as well. We're going to invite Professor Abito to come back, and um, I know he got enough questions to go till midnight, <laughs> but we're going to cut him off at 20 minutes. So I'm going to let him go to about 18 minutes, and I'm going to tell him he's got one more question. So with that, we're going to invite uh, Professor Abito to come back. Thank you. I'm in trouble here. <laughs> So many questions that I find so fascinating, and I'd like to engage each of them in the best way I can. But unfortunately, as, I, as Bob said, are you ready to stay here until midnight? <laughs> I guess not. Oh, there are some who will. We will uh, take you up on that and see uh, what we can do. So uh, let me be impartial and uh, just take the first one that comes from my shuffled deck. If there is salvation outside Christianity on earth, will it be through Christ? That's the position of Rahner, as I said, what he called inclusivism, because as a Christian, 
we believe that all salvation comes from God through Christ, God's beloved, who is the way, the truth, and the life. I stand by that. But when we read that, we see that it, it comes out in John's gospel. And if we really look closely at the uh, gospels, John's gospel stands out in a very different way from the three other gospels, Mark, Matthew, and uh, Luke. Because the three gospels called the synoptics talk about the historical Jesus, how he walked the earth, and so on, and his uh, toils and travails in preaching the word, and so on. Whereas John speaks already of Jesus from the point of view of the Logos, the Word of God from all eternity. So it is the Logos from all eternity that is speaking in John's Gospel when he says, before Abraham was, I am, and so on. So that uh, really cuts through history, uh, historical uh, process and takes us back to that time in John's prologue, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And a basic message of John's Gospel is, of course, love. So in saying that, some, uh, there are different ways in which uh, theological um, uh, interpreters have read, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Some would say, if there is love in the world, that's where Jesus is. So go with that. And that's the way. That's the truth. That's the life. So there's a way of breaking that down from the historical confines of the Jesus of Nazareth and bringing it back to the original context in which it was said. So that's one way. Well, we can continue to argue with that, but um, that's how I would just um, respond briefly to that question. And if you would like to continue, we can. Until midnight. <laughs> I'm a night owl, so I can uh, uh, stay on. Anyway. The presentation was from a Christian perspective. How would it differ from perspectives of a Muslim, a Buddhist, and so on? Indeed, I have to admit, I was speaking here as a Christian, and how I found my way through very, uh, working through these issues. And my, uh, my salvation in the way of thinking um, comes from my own encounter with Buddhists, I, uh, as, as Bob said in his introduction, I was born in the Philippines, raised there, entered the Jesuits there. And then in my 20s, I was sent to Japan to become a member of the province of the Jesuits in Japan to help in the Japanese church in proclaiming the word. But what does proclaiming the word mean in that Japanese context? For many Jesuits there, it meant that they, or rather, uh, because Japan was a very uh, spiritual country already, it had a Shinto and then a Buddhist and Confucian and Taoist um, um, background in uh, all mixed in its culture. There was already an inherent spirituality in Japanese culture, and it was so rich, so that when Christianity came in, well, again through many uh, many historical. Uh, historical vicissitudes, those who were attracted to Christianity were those who had some attraction to Western culture. And so uh, anyway, um, many people who felt that they were um, uh, also wanted to learn from the West, wanted to learn Western languages, Western culture, and so on, found that Christianity worked well in the West, so they, wanted, so they became Christian. They, uh, they brought back Christianity to Japan. These are Japanese themselves. And then also, of course, Western missionaries came to Japan and taught Christianity in their own Western mold. And so that's the form that Christianity is in Japan right now. So it never really took hold with the majority of the populace because of its, in Japan they call it a smelling of butter. You see, butter is an import from uh, the United States to Japan after the war. <laughs> so the Japanese didn't have such a thing. They had uh, their own uh, uh, ways of doing uh, things to, uh, and they didn't have bread either, they had rice. So anyway, bread and butter is an American import to Japan. So it's, it smells of butter, they would say. <laughs> And I prefer my Japanese style and so on. So that's why, well, that was one of the struggles of a very well-known novelist, Endo, uh, Shusaku Endo, 
who wrote a book, by the way, called Silence, which was made into film by uh, Martin Scorsese. I urge you to see that film, The, the Struggles of Christianity in Japan. Uh, but anyway, I'm, I'm going off track here. See, I had a little beer there thanks to the home brew that was given to me. So how would it differ from the perspective of a Muslim and a Buddhist and so on? I said I offered a Christian perspective in a way that I hope would be open to others and that I could be friends with others from a different religious faith, knowing that I respect them and that I also would like to learn from them. And in doing so, grow in my own Christian faith. Now, a Muslim would have their own sense of, well, Muhammad is the last prophet. So Christians, well, maybe we can learn something from you, but let's talk. So if there's an earnest Muslim, and there are many, uh, they then sit in dialogue and they find out that they also can learn so many other things and break through their stereotypes of what Christians are or Jews are or Buddhists are. So in fact, what I would like to really n note in uh, my uh, fumbling attempts to respond to this question is that <laughs> Muslims, as, they, as Muslims engage in interfaith dialogue with others like Christians and um, Jewish uh, Jews and Muslims uh, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, Baha'is and so on, and they can be friends with them. They are also transformed, but they come from it. They never they don't they don't feel that they have to change from being a Muslim. They get reconfirmed their Muslim faith but in a new and broad way that has dismantled the stereotypes that usually we would think Muslims have again uh, about others in the same way with Buddhists and so on. Like um, my spouse, by the way, I'm not a Jesuit anymore. Please don't misunderstand that. <laughs> when I left Japan uh, after 25, 20 years there, there was a, I, I was at a critical point of my life. I had, uh, I had met a uh, scholar who was named... Uh, Maria, and uh, we became friends, and then uh, soon the friendship became uh, became something more than just friendship. So the, the the problem, the struggle I had at that time in Japan was the song in uh, Son of Music that uh, uh, was known then. How do you solve the problem of Maria? <laughs> anyway, uh, that's another story, but. Uh, that's what brought me to Perkins in the first place. I could no longer work and teach at Sophia University, the Jesuit University, but somehow it's been a blessing all throughout. I'll, uh, I'll tell you over another drink uh, about that later. So the persons who belong to other traditions are also convinced of their tradition in a way that is now changed and more open. So we can all transform one another in the process. But who knows, there may be someone who feels, if you are a Christian engaging in interfaith dialogue, they ask you, hmm, what makes you tick? Why are you uh, so open and so welcoming and so on? Maybe I can consider being Christian too. If so, if so happen, if that, if that happens, of course, there's joy, but it's not because of what I or anybody who is Christian did. That's the working of the Holy Spirit. And so we just have to rely on the Holy Spirit to do those kinds of things if that's what God wants but not what we intend nor what we want. Because if we already have an intention that I'm going to talk to this person or to this group so that they can also uh, become Christian, if we even have an iota of a thought of wanting to convert them to our side, that already mars the conversation right from the start. And they can see that. So we have to be careful. So it's an attitude of respect, convinced of my own and knowing that I have something to offer to them, but I won't push it down their throats. That what's, that's what makes me what I am, but I also need to learn from and can learn so much from others. And in so doing, with that attitude, somehow we mutually enrich one another. And who knows what's going to happen in the process? God only knows, if you know what I mean. So do all roads lead to the same place? I don't know. <laughs> that's the weakness of the pluralist position, as I said. It tends to be it tends to, um, it tends to uh, already legislate that all roads lead to the same place anyway. How do you know? 
for example, that, that good uh, analogy of the elephant. Oh, it's just like four blind persons touching an elephant. One is touching the back, one is touching the tail, one is touching the trunk, and one is touching the, uh, uh, the tooth. But how do you know it's just one elephant? There may be other elephants. Or how do you know it's not a rhinoceros that somebody else is touching like that? <laughs> that story presupposes an omniscient seer who can judge that it's all one in the first place. But from our human standpoint, it's only our feeble attempts at articulating something where we are trying to find a common ground. And so th that, that analogy somehow is lame. There's a book by a colleague and friend of mine called Salvations by Mark Heim. And, or no, maybe not question mark, but Salvations. And he puts a plural precisely because then he describes how the different traditions that he studied with respect and with le uh, mutual learning all present a different view of what ultimate reality is. And they're irreconcilable. You cannot just blend heaven with nirvana or, uh, and so forth um, unless you really try to yank some things and try to twist them and so on. But so who knows? whether they, we all go to the same place. All we can do is, as we are taking our own arduous process of seeking what is good and what is true in our life, and meet others who are also doing the same, namely see, seeking what is true and what is good in our lives, with their own perspectives from their own religious traditions, we accept one another, we become brothers and sisters to one another, and perhaps help one another in the process. And where, where are we going? Well, let's go and see. That's the only thing I can say, uh, we can say perhaps as human beings. So, uh, I would believe in God if he welcomed everyone, but I cannot accept him being exclusive. Help, I understand. Also, yes, does anyone here believe that God does not welcome everyone? Who can say anything about God that is truly 100% sure and certified? I don't think we humans have that capacity because of our limited ways of knowing. We can only trust that God, who has been so good to us, is the author of all good. And so God is welcoming of all that God created because God created the universe out of love. So how can one welco not welcome someone who, who is one's own, I would like to say flesh and blood. So I'll say flesh and blood, yes, because God became our flesh and blood. So in that regard, when God took on our humanity, took on this Adama, this earthling that we are, then the whole earth is now seen as the subject of God's embrace. So let's enjoy that embrace and live the rest of our lives embracing one another in that regard. So in that regard, we cannot limit God. And that's the mistake of so many of whatever religious tradition, whether they be Muslim saying, God says this, therefore, we are, we are easily prone to uh, cli uh, jumping to conclusions that are unwarranted because of our own desire to be right ourselves. So a little humility might help. Should we pray for other religions? Yes! <laughs> Why not? Jesus' prayer was that all may be one but maybe not one in the way we think, that they're going to come to our side and then we'll all be nice and Christian and uh, doing the same thing. Maybe not, maybe there's another way of that oneness. And how can, that, uh, how can we find out? By trying and by trying to engage in others and also learning from the process. Have you found a way to reach Christians who maintain an exclusive position? Great question, thank you. Uh, again, um, in my classes at Perkins, there are many who come from a background where they are taught that from their Sunday school and so on. That, uh, Again, using the words of John, they take it in a very narrow way. So what I assign in my class is for each member of the class to go out and meet a person of another tradition and then join their center and go to and join their whatever they do, like worship or their service and so on, and just experience them and meet them as human beings and see what happens. Rather than trying to convince them with arguments, theological arguments and so on, I feel that an experiential encounter with the goodness of God 
found outside of Christian fences, outside of Christian parameters, might just open a person's heart to realize that God is bigger than what we think in our own minds. I feel so much tension uh, in, about all religions. How can you lower the tension? That's a good one. Indeed, right now we're living in that situation of tension. Well, uh, what this reminds me of is a quote of the Dalai Lama when uh, he was asked, how can the religions get along? Well, he said, each one who belongs to a certain tradition should learn from that tradition. If you're Christian, go thoroughly into your Christian tradition. If you're Buddhist, go thoroughly into your Buddhism, if you're Muslim, and so on. And if you examine the root teaching of how to behave toward other human beings and toward the earth, you realize that you might find that the teaching there is to love in different ways. Buddhism does, uh, doesn't use the word love, but they use compassion. And there may be other terms in other traditions. But it's, if, we, if we really look at each tradition and what it's about in its moral and ethical uh, import, each religion seems to be saying, open your heart and love your neighbor, those around you. And if we Christians, at least if we are true to that, then we have the key to world peace. And just like the so-called, uh, the uh, well-known uh, image of the candle in the darkness, if each of us lights our own candle, then maybe we can light somebody else's candle and then the, the light just spreads around. So the tension is there because of the constructs, mental constructs we have, have against the other and because of the sense that we can only feel comfortable in our own little tribe. But if we embrace the earth as our home and embrace all beings on earth as our kin, then that's our belonging, not just some little part of the earth. And so if we are able to open our heart in that way, then maybe there can be some hope in the world. And then... Professor, one more question. Oh, okay. Uh, two more. The la uh, what I had in mind, should all religions of the world develop a code of conduct together? This is being done already since, uh, in 1992, a theologian, Hans Kung, uh, uh, who recently passed away, by the way, initiated a call for a global ethic among religions. So he tried to uh, make a call for all thinkers and leaders of the world's different religions to come together in conference and s set a framework for people of all the different religious traditions to say this is something we can subscribe to together, no matter what our differences are in, the terms, in terms of the absolute and so on. A global ethic is what we all need so that we can say, we belong to this, we belong together, and we will live in this way. So that's the, uh, that's the uh, uh, proposal of Hans Kung, and I, it's continuing, it's continuing. So I hope that we can also be part of that. So okay, the last question. That I would like to hear a little more about the Zen Center. <laughs> Thank you. A little PR here. Uh, well, uh, since I came here to Perkins and to Dallas, some people have asked me uh, to sit with them and just do nothing. And that's what we do. So if you'd like to sit and uh, uh, do nothing together with a group of people and find some joy in the process, go to uh, the uh, webpage mkzc.org. It's www.mkzc.org. It's Maria Cannon Zen Center. And you'll find a lot of uh, guidelines there for going forward if you're interested in Mm, making the plunge and actually doing it with a group. And if you have questions about that later, you can ask me. So thank you very much. Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, let me tell you about next week. So we'll be back here m next Monday, 6.30, same time. Join us here in person or join us online. Um, our speaker next week is going to be the Right Reverend Dr. George Sumner, the Bishop of the Diocese of Dallas. He's going to be speaking on Christianity and suffering. 
and trying to get at the root. This perennial question is probably the number one objection that people have when they're struggling with faith is how do we reconcile an all-loving God who knows everything, who has all this power, and all this crap exists. So I want to, but I want to encourage you now to start thinking all week about the hardest questions that you can ask him <laughs> and show up with your, go ahead and take the slip off your table tonight and fill it out We'll get in with all the hardest questions that we can. Um, our rector is going to be our MC next week, and our music guest is going to be Christine Hand. It's going to be a great night, so I hope you make plans to join us. I think Professor Abito will be around for a little while for those of you who are here. I don't know if it'll be till midnight, but he'll be around. So if you didn't, if you didn't get to your question, I encourage you to, to um, impose on his grace over there. So have a good evening and blessings. <laughs>